Despite the huge cannons shown in the movie Cromwell, the exploding cannonballs and the amount of casualties per shot, the reality was a bit different in the English Civil Wars. But before we begin properly, it may be interesting to note that artillery during the English Civil Wars was not as backward and inefficient as we may think. At the first pitched battle of the war, the Earl of Essex had 30 cannon and about 15,000 men, a ratio of one gun per 500 men. At Marston Moor two years later, the Allied armies had 100 guns, one for about 300 men. Doesn't sound large numbers of cannons though, does it? Until you realise that at the Battle of Waterloo, the Duke of Wellington had 68,000 men and 150 guns, a ratio of about 1 to 450. Well, how about his opponent on that day, the former artillery officer, Napoleon Bonaparte? His Grande Armée at the Battle of Wagram in 1806 had 180,000 men and 300 guns, a ratio of 1 to 600, and at Waterloo, his ratio was 1 to 430. So the armies of this civil war were fielding similar ratios between soldiers and artillery as the great Napoleonic armies 150 years later. So what about the technology and the quality of the cannon? Captain Stoney of the Royal Artillery recorded how museum pieces matched up to the guns of his period, the Napoleonic Wars. He wrote, Anyone who examines old guns in the Tower of London or in the Museum of Artillery at Woolwich may see that they are of the same genus as modern smoothbores and even notice some specimens quite as soundly and artistically cast as any of the present century. Nay more, he may infer that our modern cast guns can scarcely be superior to the prototypes in range, power or susceptibility to rifling. The English Civil Wars began without a professional standing army and very few experienced officers and gunners. In 1642, the Master Gunner of England warned King Charles I of his force's unpreparedness, especially in artillery. The King was also warned that only four men in the land knew how to fire a mortar. Despite the amateur nature of the artillery, its lack of experienced gunners and its lack of numbers, it could still wreak havoc, death and fear. Just the noise of these huge guns would be the loudest things men would ever have heard. The loudest noise they would have heard previously would be things like church bells and perhaps lightning. Like all arms of the armies at the beginning of the conflict, weapons and ammunition were in no way uniform. Cannons would be grabbed from local armories, grand houses, city foundries, castles, from aboard and even from ships. The cannon would come in all sizes and with a huge variety of different names. However, artillery of the Civil War period can broadly be categorised into three groups. Those large enough to damage fortifications and so used for sieges, cannons small and light enough to be moved around a battlefield, and high trajectory pieces such as mortars. There was no standardisation even for naming the guns, since gun calibres were not standardised until 1716. 16th century guns were still in use and foreign imports gave more variety. To add further confusion to the myriad of names, some cannons which had shorter barrels than was typical for their calibre and weight were called bastards, while drakes were shorter and lighter versions of more standard types. Cannons would have been made from several different materials. Bronze created expensive barrels, which despite the cost had advantages over their iron counterparts. The bronze could be melted at lower temperatures, Bronze could be melted down from statues and church bells. As well, it did not corrode or rust like iron does. The main advantage of iron guns, which gradually took over, was that it was cheap. Parliament had an advantage which they held throughout the war, that the great ironworks of England were in the weald of Kent and Sussex. These great foundries had a plentiful supply of iron ore, suitable wood and watercourses. During cannon-making campaigns, as they were called, the Weald was producing between 30 and 35 cannons per week. During the reigns of James I and Charles I, staggering numbers of guns were being ordered year in, year out. In 1616, the East India Company was given permission to transport 200 cannon to the Dutch. In 1625, the Clerk of the Ordnance 
was tasked to provide 300 pieces for 30 Newcastle ships. It was not just the number of guns being produced, however, but also the amount of money that was being spent. One of the main producers of ordnance in the Weald was John Brown. In 1631, Brown was owed £10,250 by the government for his recent works. Its modern equivalent is about £1,865,000. And he himself had paid £12,000 over a three-year period for licenses to export guns and ammunition. Brown's greatest challenge and triumph, however, must have been in 1638, when he was commissioned to produce all the bronze cannon for the brand new Royal Navy ship Sovereign of the Seas. In total, 145 tons of bronze were used to make 102 pieces of varying artillery, all with roses, crowns, tridents and anchors for decoration. The bigger guns, such as the cannon, demi-cannon and culverin, had an average barrel length of up to 4 metres and could fire a solid ball of stone, lead or iron up to 27 kilograms in weight. Most cannons, like the Demi Culverin, Saker, Drake, Minion, Falconet, Robinet, Dragons, Pop Guns, Bombards, and smaller Culverin, fired a ball between 3 and 9 kilograms in weight. These would normally be seen in pitched battles between armies. There were also cannons called Serpentines, which the Germans called Schlangs or Slings, which is their word for snake. The largest gun of all, the Cannon Royal, fired a shot weighing 80 pounds but was rarely employed because of the enormous difficulties involved in transporting it, the huge amounts of gunpowder it consumed, and its very slow rate of fire, which sometimes made it possible for defenders to repair between shots some of the damage caused. This monster though was epic in every instance. It had a caliber of 8 inches. It weighed 8,000 pounds. It took a team of 16 horses or 90 men to pull it. The weight of the powder charge was 40 pounds. These figures clearly show what a terrifying weapon the Cannon Royal would be. However, its weight, cost and the logistics it required meant not too many were produced. Take a look at this bag of sugar. That weighs approximately 2 pounds. Fill 20 of those with gunpowder and you have an idea of what this beast took. There were even weapons called, wait for it, leather guns. The barrels were not themselves just made out of leather, but strengthened by it. Soldiers returning from Europe, fighting in the Thirty Years' War, had seen these strange weapons and brought the idea back to the British Isles. The idea was to reduce the amount of iron in the barrel and strengthen it with leather. The resulting gun would be a lot lighter, cheaper and easier to move over rugged terrain like the Scottish Highlands. Many guns had a range of well over a mile, but more effective ranges were about half a mile, roughly 800 yards. Well-trained crews could fire up to 15 times a minute, dependent on the size of calibre. And when firing in batteries, especially in a siege, could be fired almost continually. If not on the receiving end, these huge beasts were given nicknames by their crews like Sweet Lips, Roaring Meg, etc. Artillery became even more complicated when sieges needed specialist weapons to break the morale of a town's population. The siege mortar brought a new horror to the lives of civilians, but also headaches for the army and its crew. A mortar would need a firemaster or engineer, well versed in mathematics, to work out angles, ranges and lengths of fuse for their bombs, some weighing up to 150 pounds. All these guns would need maintenance, proving, i.e. testing the barrel with a huge charge of gunpowder checking for honeycombing or a weakening in the barrel, as well as administering all the assistants, pioneers, mattresses, horse drivers and powder guards. Right at the outbreak of the war, Parliament, like the Royal Forces, scrabbled around for the artillery they could get their hands on. After only a few days, the Earl of Essex had an artillery train of 29 guns, 11 light field guns, short drakes of £3, 4 brass ordnance of £6, 6 brass 12-pounders, two long-barrelled and four short, a demi-culverin, a drake, a whole culverin and six mortars. The ammunition to go along with this was also impressive. 200 shot per cannon, 300 case shot and 600 granados, 
blinders or gabions to protect the gunners from sharpshooters. On top of this, 1,000 tents, 850 pairs of pistols, 2 ladles, 2 sponges per gun, 20 wad hooks, 36 beds, 200 levers, 30 budge barrels, 40 hand burrows, 30 crowbars and a massive rope. In opposition to this, when the king set his standard at Nottingham in 1642, his artillery was less than prepared. A report of 1642 states that, When the king set up his standard at Nottingham, which was on the 22nd of August, he found the place much emptier than he thought the fame of his standard would have suffered it to be. He received intelligence the next day that the rebels' army, for such he now declared them, was horse, foot and cannon at Northampton. Besides that great party we left at Coventry, his, the King's, few cannon and ammunition were, however, still at York, being not yet equipped to march, though Sir John Hayden, His Majesty's faithful Lieutenant General of Ordnance, used all possible diligence to form and prepare it, nor were their foot enough levied to guard it. With the advantage Parliament had with possessing the foundries in the Weald, it was essential that the King set up a cannon-making facility, and quickly. Making his war capital at Oxford, he set about building powder mills, arms workshops and cannon foundries. It wasn't a huge success, and just like their opponents, they looked to capture as many big guns as possible, or to import foreign ordnance. One of the problems of having Oxford as a foundry were the minimal natural materials, especially iron ore. As bronze was the easier medium to work with, bronze guns were given a priority status. But as soon as all the local supplies had dried up, making bronze guns was likewise problematical. A huge programme for collecting scrap metal began for the war effort, to turn pots into cannons. Isn't it amazing how history repeats itself? In 1643, a plan was put in place to create an artillery train of 40 guns. Even with recast guns and captured weapons, this was still a big ask for the stretch royalist resources. Even if this number was hit, a lot of these cannon were used for the defence of Oxford and not for the field armies of the King. Parliamentary spies in Oxford constantly reported back to their masters. One spy, John Jennings, reported that the Royalist forces were desperately in need of powder and shot. Another spy, Samuel Brain in 1643, wrote that four new pieces of ordnance have been made in Oxford, but upon trial of them yesterday, one of them broke in pieces and the others were unuseful. With so much melting down of old barrels, recasting and cannibalisation, all these efforts didn't really increase the actual number of cannon possessed by the Royalists. The King's Artillery Park was kept at Magdalen College, but despite the grand title, it was a sorry affair. The New Model Army, a few years later, began its life with the following as an artillery train. 32 artillery pieces, 132 wagons and carts, and over 1,000 draft horses. The value of artillery is clear for all to see, in its killing ability, its effect on enemy morale, and the prestige when enemy cannon were captured. The need to protect artillery and the crews was of paramount importance, and were often given companies of firelock musketeers to protect them. Transporting artillery on 17th century roads, moving barrels of gunpowder, tons of cannonballs, tons of slow match, and all the other tools to maintain and fire the guns was a monumental task. Even getting to a battle or siege, the work was not done for these men. Defences need to be built and dug. Gabions need to be made and filled. Matrosses, assistants, master gunners, engineers and pioneers all had their role to play, a role which was fraught with danger, constantly surrounded by gunpowder and incredibly heavy guns, and animals such as horses, mules and oxen. Many were untrained for battle, easy to spook and dangerous if panicked. They would also be easy targets, as the master gunner of Lord Brooks recalled. Lord Brooks's master gunner, a marksman with a field gun, was able to cut down a whole file of enemy horse with one shot, as well as break the wheel of a gun. Five horses were found slain together, with the legs and the arms of their riders. A cannonball, even a heavy calibre, could easily be leaving the barrel at well over 1,000 feet per second, carrying a frightening amount of kinetic energy, more than capable of ploughing through ranks of six to eight men. The speed of a cannonball could even, in the 17th century, 
be reaching or surpassing the speed of sound. A report of the time described the passing of a cannonball. The ball breaks violently through the air that makes an awful crack and noise. Along with the animals, the crew were in danger all the time. Thomas Smith observed a gunner who was slain with the reverse of the gun's wheel, which crushed his leg and thigh to pieces. It is not difficult to see the trouble of dragging cannons around the countryside was not worth the results, since according to contemporary reports, they caused more terror than execution. These weapons sound a wonderful thing to capture. However, given the poor state of the roads, the fact that more than 40 horses were needed to pull one, and extra mattresses and gunners were needed to manoeuvre and fire them, they could rapidly become more of a hindrance than a blessing. Once a cannon was in place, a safe loading procedure had to be followed to ensure the gun didn't blow up in the face of the crew. The first action would be placing a worm or screw down the barrel. This would be turned to collect any burning scraps from the previous firing. Once this was done, the barrel would need to be wet mopped to make absolutely sure there were no embers left behind. And after the wet mop, a dry mop to dry the barrel out, as moisture and gunpowder are not the best of friends. A well-trained crew would make every effort not to put their body and especially their face in front of the cannon at any time in the loading process. Even the direction of a gunner's hand would be vital. The wrong way round, and if the gun were to go off, the gunner could easily lose his arms. Once the barrel was dry, the gun captain would call for a charge. These could have been pre-made cartridges in paper or canvas bags, or quite commonly, from a scoop. Now this may seem crazy, Filling a scoop from a budge barrel with loose gunpowder, not getting an exact amount, then having to walk from the barrel to the gun with spluttering match cords around, and then tipping the scoop down the barrel. Yet this is what happened, although pre-prepared cartridges were becoming more and more common. The amount of powder again had been previously determined, and some of the quantities required are quite mind-blowing. For example, one demi cannon required 22 pounds of gunpowder for a single shot. Once the gunpowder charge was tapped home to the bottom of the barrel, wadding was called for. This could be grass, hay, old canvas and even rope. The purpose of the wadding was all to do with windage. Windage is the effect of having a cannonball or musket ball in a musket which does not fit the barrel well. Due to the ill fit in the barrel, when the cannon is fired, a lot of the explosive force of the gunpowder goes around the ball and therefore a lot of velocity is lost. With wadding, more but not all of the explosive force is kept behind the cannonball, giving it more velocity and distance. After the wadding came the ammunition. If shooting at a castle wall or blocks of men in the field at a distance, round shot would be used. This solid ball would be fired to skip across the battlefield to plough through ranks of men and horse. When the enemy came closer, other ammunition would be used. Case shot often consisted of iron or lead balls encased in tin canisters or canvas bags, which were then fired from smaller artillery pieces. When fired from a cannon, the ammunition would disintegrate to unleash a deadly hail of metal. Case shot would turn the cannon into a huge shotgun, blasting a wide arc of death. Even a six pounder could potentially fire up to 72 musket balls from a single charge. During the defense of Alton Church, a drake fired and was said to have incapacitated four score of men. When the ammunition in the barrel was tapped home against the wadding, the charge, if in a prepared cartridge, would need to be pricked. This would normally be done by a brass pricker down through the touch hole. After this, the gun captain would then prime the cannon by pouring gunpowder into the touch hole until a small cone piled up on top of the gun. When the gunner was ready to fire, he would take his lit match cord which would be held by a linstock. When hot and glowing, he would then give fire to the gunpowder. If everything had been done correctly and the weather conditions are in the gunner's favor, the priming powder should explode, catching the main charge and then forcing the cannonball down the barrel. At Woolwich in 1652, tests were conducted on a 32 pounder cannon charged with 12 pounds of gunpowder. The round shot smashed through 19 inches of solid oak flew a further 14 yards and then splintered through another 19 inches of oak. It then carried on another 8 yards before ploughing into a mud bank. This frightening power 
showed the ability of a 32 pounder to be fired through both sides of a warship. The power of artillery was not only seen against warships. George Crichton describes events at the Battle of New Ross in 1643. I did see what terrible work the ordnance have done, what goodly men and horses lay there all torn and their guts lying on the ground, arms cast away and strewn all over the field. Another description of Marston Moor describes how disorientating the cannon and its smoke could be. The air was so darkened by the smoke of the powder that for a quarter of an hour together there was no light to be seen. But what the fire of the volleys of shot gave, I knew not whether to go or what to do. At the Siege of Limerick in 1642, it was recorded, No one knew how to use a cannon properly to destroy a building, so instead it blew up the master gunner and his fellows. Captain Gwynne at the Battle of Newbury, a whole file of men six deep with their heads struck off with one cannon shot of ours. At the Battle of Newburn in 1640, during the Bishop's War, a Scottish poet was so horrified by the effects of artillery that he penned these lines. The Scots cannon powder and balls did spew, thundered so as though they were riven, the burnished vault and battlements of heaven, and through their bones did scud. The whisking balls made all their cheeks so smooth, they sought no pincers for to draw a tooth. Yea, legs and arms which in the air did flee, were then cut off like gibbets fearfully. The Scottish cannon so dashed them with disdain, that hips our head their skull did spew their brains. Another poet wrote about the Thirty Years' War and described the effect of artillery as turning human bodies into a field of corn, perhaps a precursor of Cromwell's line of stubble and swords. Another description of the Battle of Newbury highlights the devastating impact of artillery on the Red Regiment of the train band. They began their battery against us with their great guns above one half hour before we could get any of our guns up to us. Our gunner dealt very ill with us, delaying to come up to us. Our noble Colonel Tucker fired one piece of ordnance against the enemy, and aiming to give fire a second time, was hit in the head by a cannonball. The enemy's cannon did play most against the Red Regiment of trained bands. They did some execution against us first, and were somewhat dreadful when men's bowels and brains flew in our faces. But blessed be God that he gave us courage, so that we have kept our ground and after a while we feared them not. Our ordnance did very good execution upon them, for we stood at so near a distance upon a plain field that we could not lightly miss one another. The view from the receiving end of cannon fire must have been impressive but terrifying. One parliamentarian, Edward Robinson, at the siege of Laven House in 1644, noted the experience as follows. Bullets made of free stone which weighed eight pound apiece. They, when shot forth, would fly as high into the air that almost a man could not see them, and then the falling was so ponderous that they break down all where they lighted. Despite the damage these guns could do to vast blocks of men, they could also be wildly inaccurate and unreliable. A great example comes from Blackburn at Christmas in 1642. A report states, A demi culverin blasted away most of the night and day following. The greatest execution it did, a bullet shot out of it and entered into a house, and burst the bottom of a frying pan. After this, the royalists withdrew, that they may eat their Christmas pies at home. Writings at the time had also mentioned the importance these great pieces of ordnance held for both sides. After a hard-fought victory, Thomas Fairfax wrote a report to his superiors. Of prisoners, we have taken 450, to whom, since we have no means of housing nor feeding them, I must tomorrow offer freedom of their parole, not again to take up arms against the forces of Parliament. He also reports on what equipment was captured, including 14 barrels of gunpowder and much ball, a great store of muskets which shall serve us well, two demi culverin with some store of nine pound shot. It was not just in pitched battles, however, where cannons played a critical role. In the English Civil Wars, castles, grand houses, towns, ports and cities were all under siege where bigger guns, mortars and different tactics were required. But like the armies at the start of the war, siege warfare was incredibly amateur in 1642. In the reign of Charles I's father, King James, a review was commissioned on the preparedness on the forts of the kingdom. It was not a glowing report. It is well worth the remembrance and consideration that whereas we have many blockhouses and castles upon sundry parts of our coasts, 
where the most easy places are for an enemy to land, and make descent the which strengths although they be not fashioned according to the modern fortifications, not of so good defence, yet are of some state. When occasion requires having also in them good stores of ordnance and allowance for munition, for soldiers and gunners, but so it is that the most of many of them are so strangely fitted with captains and soldiers that on the least alarm or sight of an enemy they would for fear play least in sight or through ignorance of martial affairs do little good if they were present. But the outbreak of war kick-started siege warfare and the science of attack and defence. Towns and cities of strategic importance would have bastions added, forts, sconces built, ditches dug and the straight flat walls of castles strengthened by earth embankments to soak up enemy artillery. In many towns it was common for old Henrician or Elizabethan defences to be redug instead of brand new defences added. Some of these projects were a Herculean task. To stop a common musket ball it was believed you needed about a foot of packed earth. To stop a cannonball on the other hand what was needed was a shoulder of defence. These shoulders would be up to 11 foot high and up to 23 foot thick. These sconces, even small ones, would need wood to be cut for revetments and platforms, gabions to be created and filled, branches, thorns and stakes in place to impede infantry. As in many wars, this type of work was often done by willing or unwilling civilians. A parliamentary pamphlet showed how joyfully the population of London went to the task of this backbreaking work. Women, children, men and higher classes all it seemed rolled up their sleeves and got their hands dirty. The daily musters and shows of all sorts of Londoners were wondrous commendable in marching to the fields and outworks as merchants, silkmen, macers and shopkeepers with great alacrity carrying upon their shoulders mattocks and wooden shovels with roaring drums, flying colours and girded swords. Most companies being interlaced with women, ladies and girls, two and two carrying baskets to advance and labour. Once again, history repeating itself. Another example of defensive measures taken to minimise the impact of an enemy's attack was Newbury. During an attack made by Parliament in February 1643, Parliament managed to temporarily seize one of the outworks. After the Royalist defenders had retaken the position, renewed effort began on bigger and better defences. More external lines were dug, which were called hornworks and crownworks. An eyewitness, John Twentyman, noted the earthworks were very high and strong. There was the King's Sconce, the Goat Bridge Hornwork, Spite's Bulwark, the Great Bulwark, the Millgate Hornwork and the Queen's Sconce, all with numerous batteries, ravelins and bastions. The Queen's Sconce covered over three acres, had a huge ditch 70 feet wide, 15 feet deep and with steep sides. It has been calculated that the digging of the ditch and using that material to create the embankments would involve the moving of approximately half a million cubic feet of earth. More impressive feats of engineering could be seen at Skipton Castle. Cannons were hauled up to the top of the towers, including a great mount which was constructed for a two-ton demi-cannon. Sieges could also see the use of mortars, such as the infamous Roaring Meg, capable of sending shells and firebombs high over defences to land in the all too flammable buildings of 17th century Britain. A royalist defender of Chester recalls the horror of firebombs. Eleven huge granados, like so many tumbling demi-phantoms, threatened to set the city, if not the whole world, on fire. This was a terrible night indeed. Our houses, like so many split vessels, crashed their supporters, burst themselves asunder, through the very violence of these descending firebrands. The Talbot and house adjoining the Eastgate flames outright. Our hands are busied in quenching this, whilst the law of nature bids us leave and seek our own security. Being thus distracted, another thundercrack invites our eyes to the most miserable spectacle that Spike could possibly present us with. Two houses in the Watergate ships, joint from joint, and creates an earthquake. The main posts jostle each other, whilst the frightened casemates fly for fear. In a word, the whole fabric is a perfect chaos, lively set forth in this metamorphosis. The grandmother, mother and three children are struck stark dead in the ruins of this humble edifice. A sepulchre well worth the enemy's remembrance. But for all this they are not satisfied. 
Women and children have not blood enough to quench their fury, and therefore about midnight they shoot seven more in the hope of great execution. One of these last night in an old man's bedchamber, almost dead with age, and send him a few days sooner to his grave than perhaps was given him. A final point on the great guns of the English Civil War. We have seen the power of these terrible weapons. The money and resources that were poured into them speak only too plainly on the importance of their role. The men using them, making them, and firing them must have been brave men. But the men on the receiving end, what about them? In a field of battle, men would be bunched together in tight formations, several men deep. They were not allowed to move quickly, to seek cover and advance when safe. They had to stand still, with their comrades, and watch as the enemy loaded, trained, and then fired their wall of death at them. Yet they marched on into a hail of shot. The weapons were indeed horrific, but they did not defeat the will of men.